Well, thank you so much, um, Anissa, for joining us today. Um, my name is Callie Evergreen. I'm from QSR and FSR Magazine, um, senior editor. And I'd love if you could just kind of give a brief introduction to who you are, your role at Focus Brands, and how long you've been there. Well, it's a pleasure meeting you, as I said, and thanks for having me. Um, I have been with Focus Brands for 11 years, and I am now the Senior Vice President of Supply Chain. So I head our entire supply chain function for a multi-branded platform company. We are unique in that we have seven brands in our portfolio, and they're all absolutely amazing brands. And I've actually been in this business my entire career, believe it or not. I started in the restaurant business when I was 14 years old. Yes, and has, I've worked, I think, every position there is to work in the restaurant. I came from a casual dining background, but worked my way through college, became a manager, and have really done so much within the industry before switching over to the corporate side of the business. Uh, I love the operations part of the business, and it will always be at my heart. And I think that's important because as a supply chain person, you want to understand that every decision you make impacts someone at that location, whether it's the guest, the manager, or the hourly employee, it impacts them. So having that perspective is really important. And for that reason, I like to hire people that have restaurant experience because I can teach you supply chain, but I can't teach you what it's like to stand in front of a customer who's angry and you don't have that product that you're promoting. <laughs> it's a hard, hard business to be in when you're trying to satisfy people. So I've been in this business for a very long time and in the corporate side of the business, mostly um, purchasing is what we used to call it back in the day, now to supply chain. I've worked for multi-branded uh, restaurant companies and a couple, 10 years each where it was a small group that was purchased by a much larger restaurant group. But each time that created a new opportunity for me to grow. And then coming to Focus Brands in 2011 was really a, my first foray into franchising, mm. which was, I'm like, okay, that's gonna be fun and challenging. And it definitely is challenging, yeah. <laughs> but it's great because you, you work with so many different people and there's a lot that you really have to keep in mind as you're making decisions because our franchisees are very vocal as they should be. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an interesting business to be in, especially now at this time. Uh, it's funny to me that I came up in this industry when it was very male dominated I remember actually being at supply chain conferences years and years ago and being one of 10 females out of hundreds of people. Wow. But now it's so encouraging. You see more and more women entering this business and becoming successful. And I think that's really cool to see that advent uh, over time to more and more people. And now every, the world knows what supply chain is. Yeah. So if there's one silver lining, maybe, of the pandemic, it's that no one understood supply chain and the impact that it has on the world until toilet paper gate happened. <laughs> when people can't get toilet paper, all of a sudden supply chain is front and center and still is largely every day on the news. So it's almost like the world woke up and found a whole new appreciation for what we do. So it's pretty darn exciting to be in supply chain at this time. It's just uh, it's a whole, just amazing world. We always knew how delicate the supply chain was and how all the dots have to connect and align perfectly, but now the world knows. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool because people, when you say I'm in supply chain, now they're like, oh my gosh, how do you do it? You're, you know, it's so important. So you're finally getting that recognition front and center. Right, oh, and no one, I suppose, recognizes it when like things are going well and, you know, until there's a delay, disruptions like you saw, and then it's like, oh, what, 
like everything stops when, working. And when it breaks is when everyone is aware. And you know, with supply chain, I'm very, very fortunate that I have such an amazing team. Even during the pandemic, when we were very limited on resources, we never had to close a restaurant because of supply chain. So that for me is a point of pride. I mean, it's awful to say that, oh, we were proud that we didn't close. But in, in, you know, before 2020, that would have been, it, it would have been unheard of. But now the world changed and supply changed and how we operate changed. So for us, that was a point of pride that none of our locations had to shut down and because of, they couldn't get product. Now, they might not have been able to get every product, sure. <laughs> but they were able to stay open. So, and, and that has to matter because the, what, and this is why I like hiring people with restaurant backgrounds, because our franchisees, that's their livelihood. That's how they make their money. And so shutting down is essentially, they're, there's no, they're not making money but yet they still have the overhead that they have to pay. So we want to make sure that they're able to open their doors every day. And while they might not be able to sell 100% of the menu, they're going to be able to sell 98 to 99% of it. But now more and more, I can see the issues getting, uh, they're still occurring. It's not perfect, never was, but it's definitely getting better. And I don't know if it's getting better or if it's because we're just, communicating more effectively. Mm -hmm. And when I say communication, I mean not just us, but our manufacturers, our distributors. They understand that communicating something is really going to transform how you handle that matter. And I can do anything if I have lead time to, to massage the issue. And so that's, that was something that really fell apart spectacularly in 2020, but there just weren't enough people to communicate these things. So, but it's, it's really cool to see this, just the tide start to turn. Uh, so either it's getting better or we're just getting uh, astute to dealing with these issues. I don't know, probably somewhere in between, but. Better at adapting and overcoming. I mean, I think we have to, challenges. right, as people, yeah. not just as supply chain for uh, professionals, we as people, we've adapted and overcome all of this just craziness that's existed over the last few years. So, I know you've mentioned that you know supply chain, the complexities. There were already like you know some moving pieces, and it was delicate, and then it kind of crumbled. And you had already you know you said pre-pandemic wanted to start making like some fixes and innovations. Can you kind of walk me through um, you know? what innovations you made, what changes you made at Focus Brands on the supply chain side? Yes, from an innovation standpoint, one of the things that it's, when you're creating supply chains, you wanna make sure you're, you're creating something that's sustainable, scalable. And I would say before, and not that anything was wrong with the way that we were doing it before, it's just that the world changed, so we had to change. So for me, the biggest investment in supply chain that we'll make in the next couple of years is with technology. Because if you want to scale and you want to add your eighth brand, ninth brand, 10th brand, it's going to be very difficult to do that with human capital. You need that technology to help improve the way you are able to look at data and actually use it. And that's the, the, the difficulty with what we do is there's so much information and almost too much information sometimes. So being able to take that and make it actionable is really what will segment the, the success, successful people from the failures because you can have all this, but if you don't know what to do with it, then it means nothing. And for us, technology and investing in supply chain technology specifically was a huge turn of events that our companies just never really looked as a priority, mainly because we didn't have to. And, and then the other side of that was really taking ownership 
taking back ownership of our supply chain. We outsourced some of our most critical functions and we brought all of those roles internally and really changed the perception. Not that it's perfect, but we we're turning that tide from within where people are, we're becoming that strategic partner to our brands and a trusted partner at that. And that makes a big difference because if we have solutions and we need our brands and our leadership to engage in, and to buy into those solutions, you have to have that foundational trust in order to accomplish that. And so having those roles brought internally where they're focused brands employees, they are committed to finding solutions for our company. And that really changed everything. And I always knew that it would and it could, but actually seeing it come to fruition is, it's just so wonderful to witness this. And then the, the talent that we've been able to bring in, like true subject matter expertise is really amazing because without that, getting through a pandemic was hard enough, but coming out of this and with the worst inflationary environment in the history of, of the world and all these challenges still around us, the geopolitical challenges, the uh, import challenges, you name it, there's challenges everywhere, but having that subject matter expertise at our helm really helps us transform the way we do business and we needed to do that. And so it's great that um, I'll give a plug to Jim Holthauser, our CEO, and Mike Dixon, our CFO. They, they saw that we could not continue to work the way we worked. We had to make fundamental changes. And so having that significant investment in supply chain was unheard of it, within our Focus Brands environment. So I'm just fortunate that all of this timed and coincided when I took over the supply chain organization. And you bring up a good point too, with you know, seven brands under you know, the focus umbrella, you know, that complicates matters too, because then you're providing support for you know, so many different players for, it's like over 6,000 restaurants, cafes. Um, and so what were some of the impacts then that you saw with that investment in you know, supply chain you know, people and then technology? Well, for us having seven brands, you, you, you have to consider this, it's like having seven separate data points, but none really came together fluidly so that we could look and, at our spend as an aggregate across the platform. We could do that, but we could not do that efficiently before. And now in that investment in technology and the subject matter expertise, we're able to look at that and truly leverage the platform. That's the whole point and the value of being part of a platform company. If I'm a franchisee and I'm considering where do I wanna invest my money, I'm going to look at that platform because I know that I'm not getting the benefit of just my spend of my brand. I'm getting the benefit of the greater organization. And so being able to, to optimize and really take advantage of those synergies across our brands and really it's bringing so much value that that brand, if it were a standalone brand, would likely not be able to negotiate the programs that we're able to because we look at our business as a whole. And so that, it's difficult because we have very distinctly different brands, um, some highly seasonal, which when you have a brand that's seasonal, you have to be prepared for the seasonality fluctuations. Uh, some of ours that are very busy in the summer and so you have to be ready for that peak season and then also the wind down. And then we have a couple of, of our specialty brands that are their busiest time of year is now, the holiday season. And so here we go, the peak season, and then we'll see that, that normalize after the first of the year. But then we have restaurant brands that are relatively stable. Uh, they have some key spikes throughout the year with 
promotions or whatever, but they're largely predictable. So having that variability, you really have to understand that because it's unique. I've worked for casual dining and restaurant companies in the past and we just didn't have that type of volatility in our volume. And as supply chain experts, you have to be highly aware of that because in, in our world, we deal with a tremendous amount of shelf sensitive items. So you can't just, uh, you can't be too far off on, on your planning because if you are, you're going to be throwing away product. And if we just heard in the uh, session before, we, food waste is, is just, it costs money, but it's also, it's waste. And we wanna avoid that at all cost and make sure that we're utilizing the product and, and not wasting. It's just, as a supply chain person, it just pains me <laughs> to see product thrown away. But of course, we would rather throw it away than, than we would never pass on an inferior product to our guest. That's the balance too. Yeah, like you said earlier, it's creating something sustainable and scalable yes. with that. Um, and so am I correct that you started at Moe's Southwest Grill? I did, yes. Uh, when I started with the company in 2011, uh, it was interesting because I love, well, first of all, huge fan of Moe's when I started and still am. Welcome to Moe's. Um, just a, great brand and a very interesting time of that the brand development cycle and started with them at that time focus brands had uh, five brands mm -hmm. but they were very siloed so when I started I ran the end-to-end -end supply chain for Moe's so it began and ended with me so complete control of everything. So if there was something wrong, it was pretty easy. Look to me, look to Anissa because she was, you know, she was in charge. But I loved that. I actually loved being able to focus. It's the first time in my entire career that I've been able to focus solely on one brand because I, every company I've worked for was a multi-branded platform. So that was a lot of fun. And I have to say we had such a great leadership team at that and still great now but back then it was just a great close-knit group of people and it was truly amazing what we were accomplishing at that time Moe's was comping double digits I mean it was just a it was a heyday <laughs> and it was a lot of fun um, and but I also knew at the same time that it didn't make sense because you know, when I started talking to my peers that were leading the supply chain for some of our other brands, what I found in some cases is that we were actually competitive with each other. And I didn't understand that. I started asking all these questions. Why don't we, why don't we get together for a cup RFP? Why don't we leverage our proteins, whatever that is, and look for the greater good? But that it just wasn't the way it was. And so that was interesting, but not sustainable. So thankfully, uh, I think it was about three years into that role is when we decided that we were going to consolidate the supply chain into a shared function. And that's when I went into working under the Focus Brands platform. So going from managing one brand to overseeing five and as the distribution and logistics function. But I was heavily involved in other aspects of the business. I mean they're all connected. So if you manage one aspect, you're involved in, in all aspects. So that was a lot of fun. Um, coming into that role was, that was a big challenge because going from a very siloed supply chain approach into a shared function was just foreign to the to focus brands at that time. But, and it was painful. I'm not going to lie and say that it was perfect because it wasn't. It was a lot of resistance. Um, brands kind of liked the way it was. They didn't see anything wrong with it. But we knew that if we didn't look at and able, if we weren't able to look at that spend across the system and truly leverage that, that we were leaving money on the table, not just for focus brands, but for our franchisees. 
How did you kind of overcome that that resistance? Did it just kind of wearing the, the franchisees down over time being like- It wasn't even the franchisees that were the biggest issue. It was really our internal, uh, because people don't like change. I mean, that's just, you know, people, I, you either embrace it or you resist it. And sometimes there's somewhere in between, but back then they felt like they were losing the their voice because they felt like, oh my gosh, now my my voice is going to be homogenized with five other brands and I'm not going to be as important as I am. And but that that was not the case. It was a very difficult time, um, but mainly because we set this up to bring a tremendous amount of value but we didn't really have, we have great people, we just didn't have the systems to support that. So everything became, it was a very manual effort to, to drive that value. And so we kind of went out as an organization and said, oh, this is, we're going to bring tremendous value by doing this, but then we didn't deliver on that quickly. And that was, I think, the miss uh, is that we probably put that out into the universe too soon before we could really truly drive value to our franchisees and to our brands. So when we did this recent transformation of our supply chain organization, I was adamant about kind of let's just hold back. We don't want to go out and wave any flags and make any grand announcements. But I'm, what I am interested in doing is touting the value of what we're doing. So being able to go out and talk about it. And the response has been pretty darn incredible. Even this year, we had our conference in, in Orlando, and it was the first time in, I don't even know how many years, probably six, seven years, that supply chain was a main stage topic. And so that was pretty cool to see the franchisees. They, I, was, I was able to talk to them about what we're doing, talk about the transformation and what that means to them. And I mean, being in supply chain, we were all kind of like, oh, am I gonna get booed when I walk on stage? <laughs> you know, because it's not a popular subject, but it was quite the opposite. Everyone was, even after, uh, after the, the uh, presentation, I had franchisees coming up to me, thanking me and asking questions and they were great questions. So to be able to get that level of engagement on a subject that is so sensitive right now with, with supply chain, that, that meant everything. Cause then you know that what you're doing is the right thing. And that was just substantiating that. And so for me, that was a very powerful turn of events where I'm like, okay, now we can start talking about this, which is why I'm here with you today <laughs> to talk about it because it really is transformational what we've done. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it, it should be talked about. We should be proud of what we've done. And I'm so proud, exceptionally proud Again, not perfect, never will be. There's no such thing, but better every single day. And that's, that's really the goal, is what can we do today that will help improve tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And someone actually said this um, recently, and I thought it was the best analogy. They said, we're here to build highways that our franchisees can drive on. And that is, that is the probably the most impactful statement because we just want to make their lives easier. We want them to be successful. We want them to grow. We want them to be profitable. So that's our job. And we know that every day when we get up and we go to work, we're here to serve, to serve them. And having a team that understands that is so critical to our business. What are the questions that franchisees are coming and asking you right now? <laughs> the number one question that I get is, when is it gonna get better? Yeah. 
<laughs> it's just, the, it's, I wish I had the answer to that. And the, my response to that, it's getting better every day. It really is. And I'm not saying that as a, just a, you know, an optimistic fool. It really is getting better every day because we're getting better and more adept at, and agile at handling what's thrown at us. And we're getting further upstream. So this investment in technology was imperative not just to be able to have this massive data lake that, of information, but also to help give us visibility to key points of our supply chain. So the more you understand upstream what, what, challenges are, what the challenges are in your supply line, the better you, re, you respond to that. So becoming much more proactive than reactive. And that's where I've had this conversation with my team when everyone was in town. I said, I want to see us go from being, prevent us from being firefighters and be more into fire prevention. Mm -hmm. Because it, we got all too comfortable with the firefighting. We had no choice because that was just the world was th you know, throwing things at us on the daily. But having that fire prevention mentality is really a whole change of philosophy. So that means being more in touch with what's happening upstream so you can, it, you can affect the downstream outcome. And that's where I, I can say to our franchisees, it is getting better. It absolutely is. It might not feel like it at this, this exact moment of this exact day, but overall, it is getting better. Mm. And like you said, you know, none of the restaurants had to close. So that's already doing. I mean, they, they had to close for various reasons, some of it labor related, but mm -hmm. not because they couldn't get their critical and core items, mm -hmm. which that again is it. That's our job. And even in the most difficult time in the history of the world, we were able to deliver on that. And that, listen, I, I can't take full credit and put that 100% of that on the, on the team, it, it took our external partners executing well as well. So our suppliers and our distributors, because they are key and critical stakeholders in our process. Mm -hmm. And if one falls down, we fall down. So thinking of that very synergistically of how we look at these, these people, the suppliers, the distributors, they're just extensions of our team. And, you know, they don't work for us. We, they partner with us to make sure those products get from A to B to C to D. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things that can happen between A to B to C to D and a lot of people that touch it. But overall, they have to be as invested in your business as you are in order to be successful. And I think this is, and I can say this, having been in this business for a long time, um, I was never a fan of the, what I would call the fist pounders. And that was usually the negotiations was win-lose. Somebody won, somebody lost. That never felt right. So now you're seeing this turn into mutually beneficial partnerships. Mm. And that is so key and critical, not just because it's the right thing to do. I mean, duh, right? It's, if, if somebody walks out of something and one person is losing, that doesn't feel good. And that's going to change how I think about you. You're not my partner at that point. So now being able to really take that to the, the nth degree and nurture those and communicate with those those partners because then I know the more I tell them about what my plans are, the better they'll be prepared and vice versa. We have to have that symbiotic relationship in order to be successful. What are kind of the advantages and disadvantages of having the kind of massive scale that Focus Brands has when you know negotiating these partnerships with vendors, suppliers? So Probably more advantages than disadvantages. Um, I would say the advantage is the scale in that we are able to leverage 
our entire spend across all our brands with key items. The disadvantage is that when you have seven brands, there's, there's always going to be complexity. So whereas I want to go negotiate a, a paper cut program, I don't necessarily have the exact same specifications across all our brands. We have unique designs. Uh, so the complexity of having multiple brands and serving the needs of that specific brand always exist. But the, the beauty is that we're able to bring all that together for one cohesive program that brings benefit to our franchisees. Going back to, you know, that sustainability piece, um, you know, what have you seen in terms of results or impacts of your, you know, data technology in being more proactive to manage food waste and things like that? So from a sustainability standpoint, I, you know, as a franchisor, managing food waste at the unit level, very difficult to do because we aren't directly in control of that but we are in, in control of some of the, the program services and systems that are instituted at that unit level. But for us, being able to put things together that we know are, we're keeping that sustainability top of mind. And one thing that we're implementing, we actually, this month, uh, implement phase one, we're rolling out a new contract management platform that will enable us to categorize our sustainability initiatives and begin to use that information to, and, and provide metrics against it. So we can actually say, here's our progress on uh, renewable energy. Here's our progress on cage-free eggs. Here's our progress on whatever the initiative is. And that's something we've never been able to do outside of an exceptionally manual process that maybe gets updated once a year. And so being able to tie that into our contract management platform creates visibility, but also accountability. And, and I think that's healthy. I mean, if you can't measure something, how are you going to monitor it? And so for us to be able to start somewhere, and here is, and we don't really know where, uh, where we are yet because we haven't even launched it, mm -hmm. but once we have that visibility, it will be, uh, each quarter will report out on our progress. Now, re in all reality, that progress for that level of uh, uh, visibility will likely not happen until 2023, but it's a start. And you have to start somewhere, right? What do you think kind of drove that to the top of the priority list for you guys? Our customers really just demand it. I mean, you have a responsibility as any corporation has a responsibility to do the right thing. And it's, it's always been important, but it hasn't been feasible. And now that we're able to leverage this platform company, and if I were a single brand and I were going to look, I wanted to look at uh, an initiative on sustainable packaging, I would have probably experienced a pretty significant cost increase in order to, to justify that, and which our franchisees would then affect their profitability and ultimately affect the guests because the, they're going to have to pass that cost on to the to their guests. So now being able to look at this as a whole and instead of as an individual brand, we're able to put, push some of these initiatives through in a more economical way and being able to, being able to provide that, that impact but not breaking the bank while we're doing it. And that, that's important because we have to keep in mind that everything we do ends up in the price of that menu item. So while it looks good and some of your customers are saying, yes, we want you to invest in these sustainability initiatives, but I don't want to pay for it. <laughs> so you have that point about elasticity where you, you can only pass so much on to the customer before they stop coming in. So you always have to be careful 
of that balance. But thankfully, because of our, our portfolio, we're able to, to provide that benefit and move toward these programs that we can go out and talk about and things that matter, especially as the generational changes happen. Our customer base is younger and younger each year and these things matter. I mean, they should matter to everyone, but they matter even more to the, these newer generations that are thinking, okay, what are, how are you leaving the world for me? You know, how, what are you doing to help improve the world and our environment. So you have to be mindful of that. And if you're not, you're going to find out very quickly through your social media platforms <laughs> because they can, they can absolutely, uh, they're relentless. But I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I think that if you find a passion for what you know is right, then you have to be relentless in the pursuit of that. So they hold us accountable and, and we have to hold ourselves accountable to meet those measures. And especially when, like you said, the technology exists to, to measure that, you know, you can't improve something if you don't know where you're at. Exactly. I mean, it, and that's a, that's a humbling statement to make, to say, I have no idea where we are. I mean, I have a general idea of, like about what we're doing, but I, I don't have an easy way to quantify it and so being able to do that is that's next level for us and then think about what we can do with that and the next thing the next thing and really just paves the path for the future of what we can what we, we what we can take on and who knows what's next right I mean <laughs> We, we never know. I mean, I, you see this more and more with the water conservation. Well, we're going to have to be even more diligent with our suppliers to make sure that they have practices that are ensuring that conservation effort. But right, you know, before we just didn't have the ability to do that. Now, through technology, we can do that. It, it makes it a little more attainable. And I think the most important thing, too, is that you're not just putting numbers out, they're real, there's an impact, and you can measure that, and you can monitor it, and you can be held accountable to that. So that's pretty exciting to get to a point where we're able to do that. Not there yet, but we'll, we're getting there very quickly, exciting. Just not fast enough, which is what he said. <laughs> it's happening, just not fast enough. What are what do those conversations look like when you go to your your suppliers, your vendors, and you're like, we want to measure this, we want you to be a partner in this, you know? You, I would say ten years ago, uh, suppliers would have looked at us like we had two heads <laughs> in that conversation. But now, there are so many other organizations that are on this same journey mm -hmm. that it's it's just table stakes at this point to that you have to be. A responsible company and you've got to do the right thing and so as the larger restaurant groups of the world the McDonald's the Chick-fil-A are making these imperatives the norm it helps us to be able to to make that impact as well not that we're riding their coattails we're driving initiatives as well but it's becoming more and more prevalent and so it's not a, an awkward conversation. Mm -hmm. And most of our larger suppliers are reporting out, if they're public companies, they're reporting out on their progress anyway. Way. So this is just, every, if everyone's doing the right thing and we're all in it together, the results can only be beneficial. And so we're, we're at that stage, I think in you know, three or five years from now, it, I can't even imagine what we'll be able to do all by all working together and making sure that we're all holding up our end of the bargain of what, what we're responsible for. So that, that's exciting because that, that's new. <laughs> it really is. And have someone that's been around for a minute, it's great to see that progress. You know, you mentioned, you know, you're, you're driving progress and also seeing obviously what, you know, competitors in the restaurant space are doing. You know, what are what kind of trends are you seeing broadly, you know, whether it's 
with other larger, you know, restaurant portfolio groups? You know, what are they doing as far as, you know, supply chain right now? Well, it's interesting because there's a lot of companies that are really, truly rethinking their innovation process. And that's poignant for a supply chain because with, with us, everything that you see new and something launched, there's a supply chain initiative behind that. And so what's interesting is once upon a time, it used to be promote, 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 promote. And now some of these major groups are being much more thoughtful and diligent about what they're putting out there. And I think that's really smart because especially with the labor challenges that the restaurant industry as a whole is continuing to experience that challenge, you have to be responsible in, cre in reducing complexity of your menu because the competitor down the street, if that employee makes the same amount of money working for a competitor, but it, uh, it's, it's not a difficult job because you don't have to memorize 150 menu items of how to execute, then you've got to know that that is a defining factor in what somebody decides of where they want to work. I mean, if the money's the same, then let's make that job a little bit easier to perform. And so seeing that advent, it's really turning the industry on its ear, really, because it used to be you always had to say, have something new, new news, new news, and now people are being much more thoughtful, methodical, diligent about what they're putting out to the universe, but not just what they're putting out to their customers, what they're doing to that labor force and the impact that it has. And I think coming from an operations background, I appreciate that because I remember being that restaurant manager and having to execute a normal menu in addition to a promotion that changed every 60 days. And it was three entrees, uh, four sides, two desserts, three beverages, and it's a constant state of flux. And ultimately, the question had to be asked is, is this what the guest wants? Or does the guest just want a great experience? Mm. And that is the question that I think now the industry is saying, you know what? We want to focus more on, del on delivering that and executing and delivering service, not creating complexity that 90% of our customers don't even care about that, that new item we were going to launch. They just, if they walked into Moe's, they just wanted to get a really good burrito that day, not necessarily, you know, some new version of that burrito. They just wanted what they wanted and they wanted it delivered with great service and executed well. So that for our industry is monumental because it's a complete shift in how we think about our business. And I think the interesting thing of that is that you know, if, if you're in marketing, marketing supply chain have always been kind of like the Hatfields and McCoys because <laughs> whatever marketing vision is, supply chain has to execute it and operations too, of course. But now you're seeing more of these collaborative discussions about, okay, this is a great idea. Can we execute it? Is it feasible? Where before it would have just been like, this is the idea we're going forward with it whether it was a good idea or not. And now it's a much more diligent thought process. So especially within Focus Brands, because we recently um, created a whole new center of excellence. That's what we call our shared services department for culinary. And implementing a stage gate process that helps us ensure that whatever our, our people are working on is impactful instead of just throwing things out into the world and seeing if it provides value, we're actually, we're monitoring, measuring, testing mm -hmm. before we go to market. And it's, it's a big change in the way we do business. And more, more and more companies are doing that. Mm -hmm. And it's the right thing to do.
Yeah, there'll always be a place for, for LTOs and new products to entice people, but I feel like we're also seeing, you know, with just celebrity partnerships at so many like quick service restaurants, a lot of times they're just remixing items that are already on their menu and kind of repackaging it in a new way so that you don't have that, you know, supply chain addition, right? It's such a really cool way to to garner attention without creating complexity to do that. And I think McDonald's has done a, a, a huge, um, they've done a great job in doing that, partnering and bringing attention, but to your point, just retooling existing menu items to do it. Mm -hmm. And if, if I'm a franchisee, that is what I want yeah. because I don't want 10 more products I have to buy that I don't want more inventory that I have to tie up, my dollars that I have to tie up in inventory to hope something sells. I just want my customers coming in and being excited about coming in. And you can do that with some of these celebrity endorsements. It's, a, it's amazing to me how that works. I mean, honestly, I'm just, <laughs> I, I guess maybe jaded from being in the business so long, but I, that would not impact my buying decision at all. But for a, a lot of people, it does. And so, you know, whatever works. <laughs> right. It's good to see that, but at least from a supply chain standpoint, that, you know, maybe you're promoting one new thing, you know, one new product that goes into that promotion instead of 20. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because it's just absolutely impossible to keep up with, with all of that and then execute a normal menu as well, so. Did that kind of, you know, symbiotic relationship with, you know, the marketing team come along because of COVID, you think? Oh, absolutely. I think that was a benefit because, again, the visibility that supply chain is delicate. And if you want to promote an item that comes from China, then you're going, this is why we have to have a long lead time to plan for this. This is why we can't be sure that we're going to be able to execute on that timing. And marketing, and in general, I'm sure there are, there's a, so many, I've worked with so many great marketing professionals throughout my career, but we kind of always had that, we were always able to come through you know, in the past where it was like, okay, this is insane what you're asking us to do, but we're gonna, we're gonna do it, we're gonna execute. And maybe it didn't go flawlessly for a million, you know, we didn't have enough time or whatever, the idea wasn't fully formed. But now you're seeing so much more collaboration in that process and questions be asked that should have been front and center all along, but now, that feasibility is top of mind. And so you have people that understand because they have been impacted personally by the difficulties in the supply chain environment. So it, it's really changed the conversation in a good way. It's almost like you said, that's why you hire restaurant people because they know the challenges and there's just certain things that you, you can't learn until you've personally experienced it. That is, it, it's so true. And you know, I have hired people that didn't have restaurant experience, but what I find is that if you weren't in a restaurant, you generally understand that, that go-getter attitude and you know, the all hands on deck, You're like, oh, something spilled in the kitchen, I've got to take care of this customer and now I have to go mop. I mean, it's just, it's a constant decision process but all of that while taking care of the guest. And so it's, it's a mentality. And it's funny because when um, my son and my two stepchildren, when they were wanting to, to get jobs for the first time, I'm like, work in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. You need to work in a restaurant because if you can work in a restaurant, if you can work and you get in between people and their food and you can do that success, successfully, you can do anything. You do. Prioritization, de-escalation. Absolutely <laughs> everything. And so every one of them worked in a restaurant and then of course decided we are never going to make a career out of this. Fair. <laughs> it's a good experience though. Yeah, yeah. Well, what else are you seeing kind of coming down the pipeline at Focus Brands? You know, what, what should readers be looking for? 
we have, uh, as I mentioned, this Culinary Center of Excellence for us um, is a huge step in the right direction of being able to really be more methodical about what we're putting out into the universe and how we're using our resources. But in addition to that, uh, the aside from supply chain, one of the largest uh, investments that we've made is on the digital side. And the work done there is just so tremendous. But you have to think about this. You can't just go out and transform our digital footprint and how we interact with our customers and, and what we're putting out into the universe without thinking about the support network behind it. So really being thoughtful about, yes, we're gonna go out, we're gonna create this whole new digital platform, we're gonna leverage the power of the portfolio and have these app-based capabilities. And that is, that is just next generation for focus brands to be able to think like that. In the past, every one of our brands was responsible for coming up with their own digital platform. So none of it connected. It was super um, difficult to manage because you had seven different platforms, sometimes nine, because some brands had multiple platforms. So no cohesiveness, no synergies. And now focus brands has said, no, here's how we're gonna do this. And I really think that in the next five years, that investment alone coupled with the supply chain is going to transform how we do business as a company and how we're able to add more brands into our portfolio seamlessly and successfully. And if you're not thinking like that, then you won't get to that next level. And so it's really exciting to see that. I'm so proud to be a part of it too, because you see this talent coming in. It's just amazing to see the work that's been done in such a short amount of time, but how, how, tra how it transforms our business and how we go to market. It's really cool. That's great. And you mentioned, obviously, you know, focus brands will continue to, to add new brands. You know, is there anything, you know, you probably can't release anything, but, you know, anything coming down the pipeline that we should just watch out for? I think we, we will always, we're in a position to acquire, and that's a good thing to be able, with our private equity group ownership, they have recently restructured some funds in order to make it more uh, accessible to funding to, to make these decisions. Um, there's a lot of things out on the market, but the, the key is just because there's a lot out there doesn't mean that it's going to be a successful opportunity for us. So I love that the way our executive leadership is looking at this is, is this brand complementary to our platform? And we've learned that lesson the hard way. Um, when we acquired Jamba, there were little to no uh, synergies from Jamba to our other brands. And now we're, we've been able to create those, but no real plug and play opportunities. So I think with the next brand and the next acquisition, we wanna make sure that we're able to, to make sure that those brands are integrated really quickly, but also that the benefit to the franchise base is obvious within a very short amount of time. Because if you can provide a winning proposition to that franchisee in the beginning of the relationship, it will set the tone of how you do business with that franchisee for the future. So that's a really key and critical component for us to, to make sure it's the right fit mm -hmm. and that we're able to do it very successfully. And that is uh, one of those hard lessons learned <laughs> in the past. But yes, I mean, we will we'll acquire more brands. There's no secret. Mm -hmm. For sure. You know, it's interesting what you said about Jamba, how, you know, it seemed, I'm sure at the time, like this incredible opportunity, but then, you know, it closes and then you're like, you know, after the fact, you're sitting there and you're like, okay, how do we make this work? Um, exactly. I, <laughs> and that's the thing, it's like, you know, it's to, to be able to go to that franchisee and, and to be able to say, hey, you know, I always think of us, uh, Focus Brands, as a power strip. 
And so you, you know, a new brand just come in and plug in and you're immediately getting the power of that portfolio. And it, the connection has to be a good connection. John, but was more like a, you know, like half in, half out of the, yeah. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't have a tremendous amount of, because it was just such a different concept in fruit, heavily fruit-based. So when you looked at Synergy's cups was really, and some of the services and back end, I mean, there was value, but not tremendous value. So being able to find that brand, the next one, that really can benefit from being part of our portfolio is really important. Mm. And setting that tone immediately out of the gate. Mm. Are there certain sectors or sort of concepts that you're thinking would be good fits, for example? Or? Well, um, so it's interesting because, you know, Jim, our CEO, he'll talk about it publicly and how he wants to be in pizza, he wants to be in burgers. And uh, so I, knowing him and what I've seen from him in the last few years, he, that's exactly what will happen as to what brands I have, you know, I can't say at this point, but I think we will we'll touch maybe some even different industries in the future. Who knows? We might even be in QSR. Uh, you know, right now we're kind of fast casual slash QSR, but sure. maybe more into that QR, QSR space, which will be interesting. Exciting. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> Well, is there anything else you wanted to be sure to mention that you think, you know, is important to, you know, the supply chain discussion, um, you know, any, anything miscellaneous you wanted to? I just, um, I think I probably said enough. <laughs> I feel like I've been talking all, um, but no, I just want to thank you for this opportunity. This was really great to be able to sit down and sometimes you're nervous going into these things because you don't know, but you made it very easy and made it comfortable.